Well, I do want to talk about my generation, the millennials. We were really coming of age during the crisis. Um, so how would you advise us to prepare, a, and, and I guess, what would you tell our generation? Uh, we feel scarred from the crisis. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think one of the problems is that the experience that you had as the last experience is the one that's going to stick in your mind and probably will not be the one that's going to get you. So that the next experience will be very, very different. Um, I, I know my, uh, my parents went through the Great Depression and then they missed out on the boom because then they, uh, they were always thinking about mm -hmm. that. And so I think, um, I think that what they need to do is see all of those crises. That's why you can see inflationary ones and see all of those and once you get that perspective. I would say three things to your generation, okay? okay? Three recommendations. The first recommendation is to, th is to think about your savings and how much money do you have for savings. And the best way to think about that is to think, how much money do I spend each month and how much money do I have saved so that I can, how many months am I going to be okay without that? And to value savings, right? And, and calculate it because savings in that is freedom and security and think about what that is. So that's, that's the first, what, how much do I have for that? The second thing is how do I save well? What should I put my saving in? And when thinking about what you should put your saving in, realize that the least risk investment that you think from volatility is the least risk investment, it, which is cash, is the worst investment over a period of time. And you could judge that by judging the rate of inflation in relationship to the after-tax income you're going to earn. So if you have an inflation rate that's 2 or 3 percent, and you're earning 1 percent, and you have to pay taxes on that 1 percent or the 1 or 2 percent that you're going to get, you're going to get taxed essentially at 2 percent a year, and that's going to be a problem. So you have to move into assets that are um, uh, other assets that are going to do better over a period of time. And when you do that, the most important thing I, I can convey to you is to diversify well. Because I can guarantee you that one of those assets, and you won't be able to pick the right one, will be disastrous in your lifetime. That you will lose half of that savings if you're in the wrong one, and you won't know what the right one is. And so pick different countries, pick different um, asset classes, and I could probably take too long explaining how you might do that. But, but so that would be the, the second thing to learn. For, first thing is think about how to save. Be cautious about debt. When you're thinking about debt, think about is that debt going to help my savings or is it going to produce an income? Sometimes debt, like buying a house or buying an apartment or buying an asset, it produces forced savings. Forced savings is a good thing. Or if you're taking on debt and you're thinking, am I going to have that debt in an asset, that asset better produce more income than the asset, than the cost of your debt. If you're using debt for consumption, that's not a good thing to do. Okay, you're giving up that, uh, that safety. So I want, so number one is think about how much you save and think about whether that should be uh, and what, how you borrow. Number two, um, make sure that you think about the diversification of that, not in cash. Um, and number three, do the opposite of what your instincts are. If you're going to play the game, um, it has to be the opposite of what your instincts in the crowd says, because the market reflects the crowd. So uh, you want to buy when no one wants to buy, and you want to sell when no one wants to sell, right? right. So, and that's emotionally difficult, um, and probably you're not going to play that game well because it takes a lot of resources to play the good. I'm, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year to try to play that game well, and it's a tough game to play well. Mm -hmm. So I would caution you about the market timing game, but I would say that if you're going to do it, do it in the ways that are uncomfortable because they're opposite your instincts. That's really good advice, Ray. Um, one more thing that really resonated with me in the book was if in the next downturn, um, some of the implications could be the impact on pension obligations, health care. Is my generation going to be on the hook for that? Yeah. So we pay a lot of attention to debt, and we should, but pension obligations and health care obligations are just like debt. 
There are obligations that require cash to fund those things. And when you think about that, uh, we don't have uh, enough money to fund those things. And so there'll be a squeeze. And I think that's also part of this political conflict, because when you say to somebody that you're not going to be able to fully fund their pension, or how are you going to fund it, what are you going to take it away from in order to fund it? Or if you think about uh, the health care issues and so on with the demographics, and it, those require taking things away from people mm -hmm. that have been promised to people. And, or do you print the money? These are issues that will be important for your generation. And you know, not only are you an incredible money manager, but you're also a really big philanthropist. And when you're talking about the next downturn, you're also bringing up some big social issues, the wealth gap. How do you think about that? How do, how do we address this issue? Because it sounds like it's going to be a very big problem. Yeah. I think uh, capitalism has got to work for all the people. And democracy has got to work for everybody. And, and we're in a situation right now because of a lot of things that it's not working for a large portion of the bottom 60%. I separated the averages to the bottom 60% and the top 40%. I could have done it the 80% or even 95%. Um, and it's not working for a large percentage of the population. We don't have adequate education. We don't create bottoms in many cases. My, my wife um, works in Connecticut to try to help uh, what are called disen uh, disengaged and disconnected youth. Look, give you a picture. Connecticut, which is the richest state in the country, or, or equal to the richest state in the country, has 22% of its high school students are disengaged or disconnected. Disengaged means they attend uh, high school, but they don't really study, they just sort of get through. And uh, disconnected means they don't even know where they are. 22%. Now those students, those people are going to be on the street. That's a problem. There are school districts um, in which they have to share books or in some cases even have to share pencils. They literally will break a pencil in half and, sh and um, sharpen it from both ends or pass it around and so on. And you know, those, that issue about opportunity in terms of education or even income opportunity um, there's a population um, that's in that bottom 60% where opiate use is rising and, um, and suicides are rising. That, I think there has to be considered a, a national emergency in which we create metrics. What are those conditions? And that there should be a dealing with that. I think that these things can be done, dealt with much, much better. Uh, but it has to be treated in a way that that's dealt with. And that has, by making them productive, I don't mean by giving money or be, by giving welfare, but by doing certain things, probably in pi private public partnerships, in which the private sector, that could be business sector, together with the government sector, can, can do the checks and balances to make those things productive. I see many of these cases. I fund, for example, uh, microfinance. Grameen America is one, but a number of those. Uh, and, and the capacity to lend somebody $1,000 and, and get paid back, not 99%, 98% payback rates. Um, and, and that $1,000 uh, can create a, the purchase of a rug cleaning piece of equipment. And that person's in business to be able to be productive. Those kinds of things need to be thought about because if we don't have capitalism working for the majority of people, it's, not, it's going to be threatened. And the same thing as democracy. The democracy is based on the notion of compromise to be able to bring people together and so on. I think if we have too much fragmentation, I think that these are the biggest risks. I think debt crises can be managed. But when you get into a bad situation, uh, as a basic principle, if you have rich and poor living together and they have to de decide how they're going to spend a budget, how they divide a pie, and you have an economic downturn, you're probably going to have a conflict. And I think that has to be dealt with. 